Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, well, uh, my name is Frances Harder. I am uh, from fashion, fashion Consulting Services, Fashion for Profit Consulting. You'll see our desk over there. We're here all week. Um, we help companies get started from branding to financing to production. So come by if you need any other information. There's a whole string of information up there on the desk. And check us out on our website. I'm here, as I say, to present these seminars for Magic and Sourcing. And so let's get going. Today we're going to be talking about branding and sustainable market and what's going on with within the industry. Those of you who are starting out, how many of you just beginning? Okay. How many of you had training within the industry? All right. So you are aware of the changes that are affecting us. So incredibly exciting, but it's also quite alarming in what's going on. So we're going to talk today about some of those exciting things that are happening, what you need to incorporate into a new company when you're starting out. And of course, we're all looking at sustainability. And what does that mean? There are so many different ways of describing sustainability. How is your company going to incorporate sustainability into your own business? In what way? What are people looking for? People are looking for customization, they're looking for individual. You know, the trends are not really as trendy as we are not being predicted to and dictated to as we used to. So when you're starting out, what is it that you're doing that nobody else is doing? How many of you have already begun the process? The first thing, obviously you need to know what your niche market is, who's going to buy from you, what are your price points, and how many of you come up the, with a name for your company? Can you give us a name for your company? Um, my business name is Six Muse. Six Muse. Yeah. Six Muse. Okay, well, kind of rolls off the tongue. So it might work without a good name, right? Six Muse. Does it mean anything? Anybody else got names? Have you got your domain name as well for that? Okay. Commons Lane. Commons Lane. Commons Lane. Okay, good. Anybody else got names that they want to share? Hoodish Apparel. Hoodish Apparel. Hoodish Apparel. Okay, well, we guess we know what that is, right? Okay. Anybody else want to share their names? Okay. Yes? Lady? Text me. Text me? Could you get that? Do you got the domain name? All right. Dot com. Okay. Well, let me introduce to you our guests, and we'll begin by talking about some of those names and how you can use those names to benefit your brand. So, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Melissa. And Melissa, you're going to tell us a little bit about what you do. She's on. She's in this new group of what's happening. And please explain what it is that you do. Hi, good morning, or good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are a little bit of a unique brand. Um, it's called Morphew. We're a vintage luxury archive. How we started in the business uh, was 10, 12 years ago. We used to schlep around to the garment district and show our vintage inspiration and print collections to designers. So we work at, from everybody from the contemporary all the way up to the couture level. And it was a business to business model. And every quarter we go around and show new collections for all the designers so then they could take that and recreate and re-inspire themselves to design their collection season after season. Um, shortly after that, long story short, we decided to turn the, the corner on that. We still do it, but we turned it into a retail division. Um, Shop Morphew has over 5,000 luxury archival goods that are globally sourced year-round. Um, and we show uh, private collectors, and it's almost like art dealing in that sense. And then we also still have our brands that come and buy for us. They might buy a vintage Victorian dress that they like the collar inspiration, or they might like a detailing. So they take that to their design teams, and then they interpret that into their own designs. Um, we also take a lot of, uh, we have a lot of different uh, variations of prints, archival prints. So we have a print showroom as well, uh, six to 10,000 prints. And then you take those, your design team will take those and recreate them, add colors and you know, do all types of things with them. And 
and uh, that's pretty much it. I'm the special projects manager. I do a lot of their marketing and PR. And I think that we are very niche because, first of all, the collection um, is archival. It's not seasonal, and it's one of one. So for our celebrity clientele, that's very um, unique to them because they come to us uh, knowing that they can find that one-of-a-kind piece. And we also have an in-house atelier, so we create things. Um, the most recent the campaign we just did was the Rihanna Fenty campaign when she's dripping in gold. That was done in our in-house atelier, done with uh, Winnings and Davis vintage metal mesh by hand. So that piece was a really beautiful work of art, and people come to that and source that from us. We also sell to the uh, film and music industry for movies, TVs, and uh, timepieces. Thank you. And you told me earlier on that some of the big brands are actually buying their brands back that are vintage pieces. Yes. That's a very interesting concept. Uh, you know, we've got a couple of uh, rare uh, Versace's, um, original. Uh, Versace has so many different uh, stages. And one of the original, uh, we have one of the largest collections of original Versace. So we did a whole pop-up in Miami at the Fianna Hotel, and we just did a whole vintage Versace Fianna pop-up. Um, and that, you know, it's archival vintage Versace. It's like hard to get your hands on. We have collectors or people that had it in Singapore that know that we can sell it and they send it to us because they know we have a market for it. Um, Roberto Cavalli is buying his own collection back from us because we'll post something on Instagram and that was an original runway couture piece that uh, Cindy Crawford had worn and he wanted it back so we sold it back to him. So it's a very niche um, product that we have and it's a great story, it's a brand story and we also, the, having the in-house atelier, we are designers, we do recreated vintage so we, in, we are constantly making vintage into new so it's sustainable. We take, we might get a Victorian collar that is perfectly in good shape, but the bottom half is all full of holes. So our in-house uh, sewers will take it apart and we'll recreate and redrape and redesign it into a new piece. And those are really our specialty pieces. So very interesting to see what's happening as far as you know, mass customization is that opposite, but it's really making individual pieces for individual whether it's stylists, stars, so it's very, uh, I think, very current. For the mass, though, we are setting a lot of the trends because we work with the designers already. So we already know what, we're already in the market looking for the trends before the designers get it, and then we meet with our design partners and we help them set their trends because we're going and buying the vintage and we're seeing what the trend is, and then we sell it to the designers, the designers then put it on the runway and sell it to the masses. So that's why at our booth, you can come over and take pictures of our trend board. We have really, really large trend boards that are really great for new designers for inspiration for what's happening. Thank you. And then I'd like to introduce our next guest uh, speaker, uh, Sir Clark McNulty. Give us a little bit of background and uh, your expertise. And, you know, he's certainly the link that you all need and you can't live without. Well, I appreciate that, Francis. Hi, my name is Clark McNulty. I'm with Elk uh, Marketing. We are essentially a digital marketing agency based out of Santa Monica. We are brand builders. We help build your brand. So everybody that's here, you're looking to expand your brand's presence online, and that's what we do. So really, you know, today, at the end here, we want to get into some Q&A, but um, the biggest thing for you guys, a lot of you guys seem to be starting out is in, in just general terms is my question to you would be, do you have an effective brand story document built out already? Do you have a style guide, you know, text, look and feel, fonts, colors, logos, those kind of marketing assets that you're going to need to put out the marketing materials to get to start to drive sales, to start your ad campaigns, to start to build and brand your business online with. So those are two really huge things that I would ask you right off the bat, brand story and style guides to start. So um, that's essentially, you know, from a branding perspective, what we look at, those are the first questions we ask. And then we go way deeper beyond that. So it would be, what platforms are you using if you're B2C? Are you selling online? Are you using Shopify, WooCommerce? What digital channels are you in? Are you in social media? Are you, you know, where are your customers at, your target audience? And those are things that you'll develop within your brand story. You'll identify what your messaging is, your overall vision, your customer base, which is your target audience, 
and the emotional drivers of why your brand exists. So those are super critical to, uh, to have on paper, number one, so you can relay that to a partner, to an agency, to a client, to a customer. Um, so that's usually where I begin in the, in the marketing process with new brands. Um, can I add to that? Um, another reason why Clark is really important too as a brand in the way fashion has changed is the brand story doesn't stay the same for as long. You, you will create a brand strategy, but I think in this ever really fast changing market, it's always important to understand how the brand, brand uh, strategy needs to change again. Say for somebody like us, we've been in business for a long time and we're kind of dinosaurs now, so we are in the, in the process of recreating our brand story. Same brand, same everything, but it's really important to keep that forefront thinking because we have to keep up with this market. This market is going at a exponential pace and uh, you have to rethink that brand strategy twice. Um, if you're an established and successful designer. So he's really important because he's a beginning process and the middle process and hopefully the, the, the evolutional process. So one of the first things you need to really think about once you've chosen your name is obviously your niche. And then what is the biggest, I say, verb that you can really think about is consistency. In order for people to recognize you, you need to be seen at least six or seven times before it registers. So you know yourself, you see somebody walking around with some strange outfit on the first time you see it and you go, wow, what the hell is she wearing? And then you see it again, and then you see it again, and then you see it again, and eventually you go, maybe I need to get one of those. So it's about being consistent. And then once you've got that consistency and making sure people then can begin to recognize your brand. The other thing is very important so you don't lose your audience is making sure that you are consistent with the fit, with the look, with the finish. If anything goes wrong, so somebody starts to buy your goods and they wash and they shrink or there's something going wrong with it, are they going to come back and buy from you again? No. So make sure that what you're doing all the way through is perfected to the point where you can consistently be recognized as a brand. So choosing a name, thinking of being, how are you going to market it? Are you selling bricks and mortar? Are you selling online? How many of you are selling online? Just online. Okay, so we see majority of you are going that way, which really, when you look at it, is probably the future. But one of the biggest things, and I think this is what also is so great about you, what you do is, the aspect of helping people understand how to wear your product. It's about merchandising, more so than design these days. It's showing how people can put these pieces together. So if you remember somebody like Nasty Girl, who actually I was fortunate enough to be able to help launch, she was in one of our sessions. Now you all know a Nasty Girl, right? What is it she did? She was buying vintage pieces. She was then buying new pieces from from the Korean cheap market down in Los Angeles. She was buying reband sunglasses and she was putting it all together to sell a total look. So how is it that you're going to do, because of this, this lack of trends that you really, you know, not, not dictated to anymore, it's very important that you show people how to wear your products. I think and also too what's really important about that with the marketing and seeing yourself seven times Say you're a t-shirt designer, well, there's a lot of t-shirt designers out there. You need your marketing um, pieces as well. It's really important for new designers to understand. So things that you're blasting up on social media or that you want to see visually, you know, reproduce a couple times over and over again for brand recognition, you need to do those kind of expensive one-off pieces that are really, you know, not affecting your cost margins just for show. I mean, that's basically your fashion show because we all don't have the, the capability, not actually the fashion shows don't dictate the way they do anymore. So you need those specialty pieces to design that you might co-collaborate with. I don't know, I'm just going to use Swarovski and throw some Swarovski crystals and do something crazy with it. And then that's your marketing piece. You're going to constantly need those to get your brand recognition going. Um, yeah, I think the cohesive word here is uniqueness. And I think if you, can, if you have a brand that you can create a unique style with, one of the challenges that I do see with a lot of brands is they create a look, a season that is really hot, it works for, for six months, and then since they were they did really well with that campaign, they wanna they wanna do a new season. But they forego the what actually brought them at that initial success, right? So if you're running from an advertising standpoint on social media channels, you know, I would just some food for thought, if you have successful marketing campaigns that are running, 
don't shut down that old season, especially if you've been doing some solid sales online with that season. Keep those, what we call evergreen products alive so that your existing customer base can still purchase those items, still launch the new season, but keep that seasonal driver that worked last season alive. If you shut that down, you probably see a really significant drop in sales. And from time and time again, I've seen this and we definitely advise against that. So if you have something that works, don't necessarily change it. Do something new and add to your campaign, your ad set. So just something to think about. If you find a unique niche, keep it alive. Don't don't switch it. Even if you're super creative, which a lot of these brands and you guys are, you want to keep that creativity aspect going within the brand, but don't shut down the old the uh, the old campaigns. We recently had that happen to us. I can't remember what the piece was or the designer who wore or the celebrity who wore it. It was something that was kind of we did early on and then it got reposted because somebody did like a TBT and we got 800,000 views on it just from that TBT. So that was a, you know, a great example of how that works for you in your favor, um, keeping yourself updated and getting your views and your likes and all that and then people, new people to your brand. Um, it's really important and so you got to keep that in mind consistently about how you can keep those things going. Well, here's a question from a dinosaur. What is TBD? Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, throwback Thursday. Sorry. Hashtag Throwback Thursday. Well, well how would you use that? So they, early on in social media, they created uh, hashtags before there was a 9,000 of them. One of the original uh, hashtags was TBT. So that meant on Thursdays, everybody would post like a Throwback Thursday hashtag. But it wasn't because people cared about what happened on Thursday. It was because they wanted to teach the market how to use an effective hashtag. So TBT was one of the early on hashtags that you know these companies came up with. But now everything's a hashtag. So how many of you knew that? <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. All right. So okay. Uh, sorry, Francis, Rich, brother, the brother Clark. Tell us a little bit about when you meet with these brands because one of the issues, and I know this personally, is you're so busy creating and then getting the production done, then selling, and all the things, that, all the different hats that you have to wear. What do you do? Who is, who's going to answer that question at the end of the day? Oh my God, now I've got to do my social media. How is it that a social media sort of contacting someone like you who can help them with their products? Sure, I mean, I think marketing in general is about omni-channel balance. So it's not just social media. It does depend on the brand and where your customers live online. But so as we know, social media is a really big component of that. So what we look at first is brand story. What What's your style guide look like? What's your messaging? If you have that stuff set in place, great. Then we look at your platform. Where are you selling online? And what is that, what we call tech stack look like? So what is the, your shop, let's say you're on Shopify. What does your tech stack within Shopify look like? Do you have pixels embedded on your website to start to track who visits your website so you can, one, collect information and retarget them where else they live and visit online? So your tech stack goes really deep. It could be, you know, you also want to have some basics, Google Analytics. You know, you want to know how to interpret the data within Google Analytics. So that's one component, another component of your tech stack. You also want to look at what plugins you have and that you're using within Shopify itself. So, you know, you have people that are, you're driving traffic effectively to your website. What's happening to those customers or those clients that you've already acquired but they haven't checked out? How are you re-engaging those customers once you've already acquired them? So do you have you know, specific plugins like an automated email flow? There's a, a, a plugin called Clavio. It's an outbound automated email campaign piece that you can use to interact and engage people who've abandoned cart. You can do winback series. You can do thank you series. And what's important about that is the winback series and the thank you series and the welcome series are all about engaging the customer and informing them about what your brand does and the emotional drivers which are embedded into your brand or into your brand story. And you want to tell them about that because that might be something that converts them into an actual purchase. Now, if you look at that tech stack and those automated email flows, you might have one, two, three, four different emails that are going out to these people to try and re-engage them during the course of this conversion funnel, right? So your first email might be, hey, we noticed you didn't check out. How can we help you? Here's Click here to go back to your order. Click here to talk to a customer service at rep. 
Second email might be, hey, here's an incentive to incentivize them to purchase 10% off, 15% off, a free lapel, a free sticker, a free t-shirt, a free something, right, to engage them to actually convert into a purchase. The third email could be a, another incentive, and then the fourth sort of goes back to the original, which is, you know, we value you as a customer, we'd love to help you check out. So you want to have a lot of different um, pieces enabled in your tech stack to convert those users where they are in line. So, and Clubio is just sort of one of those pieces. There's upsell apps and uh, shipping apps that engage the customer based on hitting a certain shipping tier. So if they ordered $75 of product and there's a the free shipping is engaged at 100, then it'll have a pop-up that enables, hey, you're $25 away from free shipping. So there's a lot of different pieces you can add to your tech stack to engage the, the, the customer and everybody's different. So you want to have a pretty robust uh, data um, or tech stack to engage them where they are. Is that something you do for them or are you advising them as to how to do it? Well, back to your word of consistency, it's it's consistency and execution. So a lot of this gets really deep really fast. So if you're trying to run the brand, manufacture, you know, drive traffic, you know, manage your business, doing all this is very difficult. So, you know, we as an agency, that's what we do. Uh, that's what we specialize in on a daily basis, and that's how we help our customers. We look at their brand story, we help them build that. We look at their tech stack, we help them buff that out. We look at their marketing objectives and their goals, and then we help them drive traffic in the specific verticals or marketing channels that are relevant to their customer base. How do they get the contacts? I mean, I've got, through many years of being in business, around about 17,000 database, and we're cleaning it up all the time. And can we have that? You can buy can it. have that list? <laughs> you can buy it, darling. <laughs> they just said recently that data is the most more expensive than gold and oil. Data. That's true. I mean, people uh, join the Fashion for Profit website so that they can market their product through it. So it's, it's worth you know finding out, collecting your own data. How many of you got their own good database? Yeah, so that, that flows right into building custom audiences in Facebook and Instagram and even in, in Google you can do it. But Facebook's super strong with custom audience building. So if you have an email list or a list of a thousand people, you want to build a custom audience that you can identify a Facebook profile that ties to that email. And then you specifically targeting those people with custom ad sets to engage them in the brand. You can also go um, procure lists of people that might be relevant to your brand. You can also go run email acquisition campaigns by doing product giveaways, incentives to get people to submit their email to you, you're building out lists, you're putting that into Facebook, building a custom audience, targeting them, at the same time you're using that in outbound email campaigns. So you're, you're multiple marketing verticals at one time to hit them where they might be online. Most people, you know, maybe they're not on Facebook that day but they're reading their emails. So you want to be hitting them in multiple channels or have an omni-channel balance. One thing I also suggest is when you're starting out, is you're beginning this process, you're beginning your journey. Now, if you're thinking about, think about giving back in some way, whether it's a portion of your profits go to cancer research or, you know, sex trafficking or whatever it is, by doing something that's giving back also gives you a great sort of platform for extra marketing for getting exposure for your new brand. So how is it that you're going to affect and help and give back in some way but also promote your own brand? So doing something that's also a give back is also a really good marketing plan. I also, um, another thing that I would recommend as new designers um, to piggyback on that is before, uh, I used to be a production manager for designers. That was how I started out in this business. I went to design school and I had a consulting service and I used to tell people, they would ask me, well, how am I going to spend my money? My, you know, I have $40,000 to sign this line. And back in the day, we'd say, hire a showroom, hire a PR team, and then do the things yourself. Now that's completely changed. Now I would tell somebody to hire him first and do everything else later. I don't even think there's, you know, like just skip, go ahead and skip the other stuff, hire them, and then, you know. Because really, I mean, I, I feel like a dinosaur sometimes because I, we, we know what he's doing. 
we were an online platform that sold one item online on our direct site when we first started. One item a month. Um, but we were selling through on other uh, channels, so we were okay, but we were always kind of confused to why on our website that we spent an obscene amount of money to build was only selling through one product. So we were like, well, it's brand recognition when we first started. Um, so that's another reason why what he does interests me so much because I, it's not the language that I speak, but I need to know how to speak that language for our brand and to communicate our brand message and our brand story through him because our methods don't always work or, you know, our other marketing and ideas like the big kind of creative ideas can come from us but we need him to strategize them because if we sat on a round table meeting with my design team and everybody who's in the office we would all just you know it'd be a bad meeting so you know we need somebody to kind of lead the train on that and I think that's where a company like um, Clark's is, is phenomenal because they're just, they just take that heavy thinking out of it for that strategy and I think that it's really important for new designers to figure figure it out real fast yeah, I think it's, it, again, it comes back to, thank you for that, appreciate that. It was, it's really about, um, you know, balancing multiple marketing channels and, and those efforts succinctly at once. So in, in my mind, it's, you know, you have to almost think of like the stock market and day trading funds. You know, you have, you know, 10 different stocks that you're trading at once. And if that stock's not performing in the day, you're, you're closing that out and you're moving your money somewhere else. So it's the same thing with these marketing channels. You want to look at, you might have 10 different ad sets running to 10 different marketing segments in Facebook. And if one's not performing, you're shutting it down and you're moving it to the ones that are. So that's where it gets tricky and complicated over time is that performance-based marketing is such that it needs to be managed daily. And if you don't have the time to do that, that's where you know we try and come in and help brand, the brands that we work with and help them scale. Because really at the end of the day, it's all about revenue and return on investment. So what is the ad spend that goes in and what are the dollars that are coming out on the sales side through your shopping platform? Another, oh, another thing with that too is that what we kind of learned uh, that we needed to do, when people say we sell online, that doesn't just mean you're online, you know, www.melissa.com. You have to think about what other online channels you're going to sell through. And you have to strategize your negotiating with them. So before we would sell, we were a new designer, we want to sell to Macy's, we want to sell to Nordstrom's, we want to sell to all these stores. Well, it doesn't work like that anymore. We want to sell to online platforms that give us this nice little package and they sell us all these things that we have no clue what they're telling. They're going to give us analytics. Well, if you don't negotiate those things, now you have negotiating power because somebody like Clark can say, you know, they're telling you this, but you know, because you, you have to know what they're selling you, and you have to, you can actually negotiate those things because your your platform isn't enough. You have to have your other online platforms that you're selling your brand through, and strategize each one of those as well as your own strategy. So it's a complete formula of strategy, and you know what you said, performance-based uh, marketing. So you got to think of all that when you're selling on other platforms as well. And I believe that you, um, I had a meeting with him, and I believe they help you look at those analytics and see what you are getting. Yeah, we definitely want to look at what your cost basis is, where you're spending, and make sure that you're getting value out of each one of those channels. So, And that's something you guys should definitely be doing with your own brands. Where are you spending money on this piece of software and that email marketing platform, and you're paying this consultancy fee, and you're paying for, you know, shop these platforms. So look at those in a spreadsheet and see, you know, if you can measure them, which you want to be able to measure them for value, and see, recon see if you can reconcile that ROI. Um, we do that on a daily basis for our customers. Plus, our, a lot of our clients come to us with platforms and they say, can you vet this for us? Or someone emailed me and they pitched me on this software. Is it good? Should I be looking at that? So we try and help them determine, yes, this might be valuable to you. No, it won't. Because we don't want them to be spending... Essentially, we want you guys as, as brands to be spending your money most effectively to be able to see a return. That's bottom line. You want to see the return on investment and on ad spend. If any of you are selling on Amazon, Okay, well, I deal with Amazon and it's pretty tricky. Are you, have you had any experience? We do have customers that sell on Amazon. Um, There's I've, two places to do it, either it's Advantage or Marketplace, but it's quite time consuming. Well, I mean, it, it can be beneficial. I mean, you got to look at Amazon yeah. as the number two search engine in the world right now. You know, you have Google number one and Amazon's number two. So, you know, I would highly advise if you do have a pretty robust product line to be 
putting that into Amazon and be selling there. You have to know that the margins are your margins are going to be reduced when you're selling into Amazon versus directly selling on your own B2C channel, i.e. your own shopping cart. So it's just the nature of doing business, but you're going to get a lot more um, um, brand awareness, obviously, if you have an inventory or a product line that you can sell in, uh, in Amazon. I just have a quick question for the audience. Do you guys all know what we're talking about when we're saying selling on other platforms? Is that, is that confusing, right? Okay. I just want to make sure. I know I sell on Amazon Marketplace and on the Advantage. And I would recommend Marketplace because you keep your price point. It's your your money that you're, when they buy it, it comes to you. It doesn't go to Advantage because they buy it from wholesale from you, Advantage, rather than Marketplace. So um, I've had quite a few complications with that. But, you know, certainly a great platform. What, what other platforms would you recommend? Well, I mean, I guess it really depends. Um, since we're a, a digital consultancy, we have our own preferences on shopping carts that we like to use. And the reason is that, you know, we like the tech stack that we can plug into those specific shopping carts. I mean, I personally recommend Shop, um, Shopify. That's what we will build on most of the time. Now, if it's other platforms, other channels that you're selling through, Amazon, yeah, I would, like I said before, if you have a product line that is robust enough, I would definitely put it into Amazon. We uh, Google Shopping would be another one. So if you guys, um, you know, again, I would explore Google Shopping. Um, yeah, it really depends on the brand, essentially, and, and if you're B2C, B2B. But uh, if you have questions on that, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. No, I was just saying, we sell, I mean, we do all our things on Shopify, but we sell through online platforms like First Dibs, um, Etsy, we still use all those as our online platforms as well. I mean, we are, like I said, we're a little bit different with uh, retail, but you know, those those methods still work for us. I mean, and sometimes we get really big, you know, client from those channels because they shop through. The, everybody's shopping on everywhere, um, celebrities as well as you know people that are just shopping, and they come through these other platform channels. But our, the back end is all like what he was talking about, Shopify and all that. So that's another area to explore. Um, like Shopbop, um, Farfetch. I mean, there's so many different online platforms that as new designers you guys can sell to. And understanding that marketing strategy and how that works for you and your brand. And it's also important to remember that you can do private label as new designers. Um, private label helps a lot of new designers get a lot of bread and butter. And we were, we were having a funny dinner uh, conversation last night about how we used to, there used to be these companies called Art and D and uh, Art and B and Black House White Market. And we were all new designers in the industry, but we'd have to make one pair of pants but we'd have to make 10,000 of them. And the compliance uh, you know, methods for that. So it's just all these different things, that all these different channels that could help new designers, um, even though it's not your brand. Like the, uh, these black pants aren't really what my brand is. But somebody liked them when they came to your showroom and they wanted to buy that pant. It just helps your brand elevate, get some money in there as well. One thing I wanted to point out, any of you thinking of selling on Etsy or are you already selling on Etsy? How many of you are selling on Etsy? Okay. It's fine for yours to do that, but in fact, in California and New York, it's against the law for you to produce your own goods and sell them. In other words, to sew them at home and sell them. You have to have a license, and you need to make sure that whoever you're working with, your contractor, has a license. So I'm always surprised that Etsy goes under the radar, having people sell the products that they've made at home. But the reason for that is that they found a bunch of sewers in El Monte all chained to sewing machines in diapers. This was in the early 90s. And so the industry came together and said, we cannot have this for our our industry so you have to take uh, get a license for that it's like 750 a year uh, your contractor has to have a license make sure that whoever you're dealing with is absolutely licensed to do what they're doing get a copy of their license otherwise they'll come after you I've had companies who have been working in the garage and they've applied for a license and they come along and they confiscate everything so be very aware of exactly what it is that you're doing so that you don't fall into that slot of thinking that you can sew from your own home and sell. It's not going to work. So make sure that you understand all the rules and regulations and laws when it's attached to that. Um, should we open it up for questions yeah. and see? Okay, anybody got questions for our panel? Any questions on branding, how to build brand stories? Shopping platforms, social media, posting, what's too much, what's too little. 
Are you helping companies in um, international, like selling into China, selling into other places? No, we're, we're U.S. We're focused all here. North America. You sell international. Yeah. We're, we're right. global. Yeah. And do you do you do all the social media for that? Or how, how do you do it? Have you protected your brand in those countries? So have you registered the brand so you trademarked it and copyrighted? Yes, we were selling in other countries or marketing in other countries? Both. We sell in other countries. I don't know uh, if we're doing direct marketing to other countries. You just got to make sure you protect your brand. If you're thinking of selling internationally, then you need to register that brand with that country. Otherwise, you're going to be ripped off. They're going to take your name and you'll never be able to use it unless you buy it back for millions of dollars. So wherever you go and you're thinking of selling into these different marketplaces, believe me, you know, the Chinese love made in America. So they're looking for brands that they could buy. But you can protect your own brands by in these countries by making sure that you are registered with your logo and all the other intellectual properties that you need. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have a, a startup. It's stuck in startup. But um, it's stuck so where? It's stuck in startup. It's okay. stuck in the startup phase, you know. But um, so if I ship internationally, then my word mark, trademark, does not hold any. No, you protect it in those countries. So oh, I have to buy a word mark in other countries. You can just. In fact, we're having product. an attorney in tomorrow, and he's going to explain. But you need to. Go and protect it in that particular area wherever you're selling, whichever country internationally. And you pay, um, like, you've protected it here in the US, right? Yeah. Registered. Yeah. So if, once you register, then you do the same in each country. The, okay. the uh, European Union, you need to just register once and you are protected. Come? I think we are registered in Europe because we sell a lot in Europe. Yeah, you, in well, Europe, if, you just register. If someone, once. If someone buys one of my products in Europe, you, I'm not going to worry about it. Well, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever you do, you're always open to being knocked off. And it's knocked high, off by them? By anybody, yeah, anyone. Yeah. I mean, it's the highest form of flattery, isn't it? But if so, one person happens. buys my product, yeah. I, I would hope 20 people do. Yeah. That's fine. If they're going to knock me off, use my word mark and buy a bunch. And then you're going to go to my online site and buy my Yeah, product. but they're, they're selling it cheaper right. than yours, you see. And then they're going to undermine you. And you don't want to lose your brand. So. Well, no, I'm know. not going to lose my brand, but they're going to go to my site to buy my clothing. No, they, they would make it themselves. They're going to knock you off. But they're going to go online. They'll go online and buy it and then knock it off. Yeah, but online is my site. Yeah. I know, but they can do the same thing in that country. So you've got, you know, you can't register all around the world. It will cost you thousands of dollars. So you have to think about where it is that you want to sell your goods to. Okay, so I was just wondering how often to post. How I mean, what's too much? What's too much? What's too little? Good question. So there is not, there is really, too much is not a, a thing really, in my mind. I think at the end of the day, you want to be in front of your customer as much as possible. You're going to suffer attrition no matter what in the marketing game, meaning people are going to opt out of your email chains. They're going to opt, they're not going to follow you anymore because they've moved on from the brand. They're disengaged. That's just the nature of the business. So the real problem is posting too little, not having enough content consistency, content velocity is a thing, right? So that's a term, content velocity. You need, it really applies more towards search engine optimization than it does to social, but it's still relevant, right? Like you, you want to have a constant flow of content across your social media channels every day. And um, so I would just say, think of that term content velocity, you know, to be used across each one of your digital channels. SEO is a little bit different, be, different because from a content production standpoint, you know, and what I mean there, content production in, in when related to search engine optimization is article production, blogging. So... How often are you blogging? What's your velocity on the blogs? Are you blogging twice a, twice a week, three times a week? Because the way that Google's algorithms work and the way that quality score works within Google is they give you, just think of it as a thumbs up, if they start to see a pattern of velocity. Now, if you only post two blogs a month and then it falls off and goes to one and then it bumps to three, there's no consistent pattern. So you wanna make sure that your velocity is consistent. What about Twitter? Twitter, I mean, if you look at um, 
article production or content production as a whole, let's say you wrote a blog, all those pieces of content from that one article, you want to cut up into multiple pieces of content to be uh, deployed multi-channel. So if you wrote a blog, you're going to put a snackable piece of content on Instagram about the blog to drive people from Instagram to your website. You also want to put a link in Twitter to drive them from Twitter to your website. If your, pixel, if your site's pixel correctly, you're going to now start to capture all that traffic by cooking those people and you're now going to have them in your marketing funnel. You're going to be retargeting them, you're going to be emailing them, you're going to be hitting them with abandoned carts during the checkout because they've left during the checkout phase. So there's a lot of things. You're really trying to get them into that funnel. So that's a great question, Francis, is, you know, take you can take one piece of content and cut it up a thousand different ways. Is there a, a sweet spot for the number of hashtags you should be putting in a post? I mean, you need a hashtag, definitely. So, you know, I don't know if there's necessarily a sweet spot on ha hashtagging. I would say that it's really more about... Um, just consistency in your, your hashtag game itself, right? So finding hashtags that have really high volume or, or high follower bases because you can obviously follow hashtags now. So looking at doing your hashtag research and understanding, okay, these are the 20 hashtags that are relevant to my brand and that have a really fi high follower count. So people that, you know, when you post there, people are, who follow those are going to see your content. And then one more, um, what about as a brand liking other people's posts? Is there a percentage of the number of likes you should be doing um, for you know your consumers? That Engagement is a thing. Yeah, it's part of the algorithm. So you want to be, you know, messaging, direct messaging, story posting. Story postings, you know, as far as engagement goes, we see a lot more engagement in stories than we do just on posting on your profiles now. So, um, and then sharing stories. So it's all about, I mean, these are social tools. So you want to be as social as possible when you're using them question is, what is the magic or what is the importance in finding the right influencers to help you with social media? Sure, great question. So influencers, and we've all heard about influencers, um, you know, the magic behind influencers is volume. And, and it's just marketing in general. It's all about volume, right? So to me, we've all seen these huge influencers, you know, 500,000, a million, you know, the Kardashians of the world. But really what it's about now for our brands is, is nano influencers and micro influencers. So what do those audiences look like? You know, what do their follower bases look like? They're 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 followers. So those are those are micro influencers to me. And the 10,000 you know, follower influencer is super critical to your brand because if you look at the engagement of those influencer bases, they have really high engagement rates because the people that follow them take them as a credible source for what they're doing in that industry. So finding, you know, 10, 15, 30, 100 influencers that have 5,000 followers can be really beneficial to growing your brand, especially if you have a product that you can actively distribute, ship out, structure a campaign and we do that effectively for a few of our clients now so it's it's definitely important it's it's one of those verticals you want to be looking at yeah because most of them so she asked about geography so a lot of these influencers you know i have one client right now they're they're really heavy on the west coast they have no east coast uh, brand presence at all so we have 10 different influencers that are 50,000 and above and they're marketing that product on the East Coast, and now we're starting to see sales pick up from addresses shipping to the East Coast. So finding influencers that are geographic specific um, can definitely help you expand brand presence. Yeah. I had a question about Naki Um What if people use your pictures to sell their stuff on Instagram? What do you do about that? Copyright infringements, yeah. So. Well, I well actually I work as an expert witness, and I do a lot of legal work. So I work as an expert witness on these types of cases. Yeah. 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 So you know, if you've got a good case, they may take it on a contingency basis. But, 
Well, they might take it on a contingency basis, but you know, knocking off is that's a big problem. You know, you, there's no real design protection in in America. However, if there's real proof, and we've won the cases, a number of cases where it's absolutely obviously they've knocked it off. I measure the garment, and then I might measure the knockoff garment. Everything is in the same position. We won the case. Same with copyright. If you've got someone who's taking your logo and then they're messing around, this is a big problem with a lot of people who think they, they learn this at school. Okay, you've got a nice print, you like it, scan it in. Let's manipulate it 30% and then it becomes yours. No. If it looks the same, it is the same. You're going to get sued. Diet make... Prada will find you. Pardon? Diet Prada will find you. <laughs> yeah, well, somebody will find you. Well, Diet Prada is an Instagram account that goes and finds direct knockoffs of huge, huge designers, and he will blast them on. And we have people uh, in the vintage world, in our world, we have a lot of that happening because they will take direct Couture House's exact replicas of their designs and knock them off. And Diet Prada has caused a lot of litigation because they'll go and sue the other company. He's blasting everybody, and uh, he's doing a good job at it. Yeah, I know. They, they come and ask us about questions about things, because we're an archive, so we get archival questions from them. There's, there's, there's huge money involved in it, but if you've got a good case, you may find an attorney will take it on a contingency. So let me know. <laughs> Any other questions? Hello, we have a virtual question. Um, what do you think is the best way to get funding for your startup? Is it crowdfunding, angel investors, or something else? Well, funding is, first of all, no one's going to fund you in the beginning until you've proven you've got something that people want to buy. So the first thing is go out, make sure that somebody wants to buy what it is that you're making, and you can then you make sure you can produce it. Remember, when people start giving you money, they're investing in you and making sure that you know what you're doing. So as you're starting out as a startup company, and I talk about this many, many times, you need money to start a business. It's practically impossible to start a business without money. So where's your money coming from? How many of you got a business plan? You need to project, okay, A plus over there, right? You need to project where your money's coming from and how's it going out, when's it coming back in? And if you try to think about starting a business without money, you'll just be getting yourself further and further into debt. The other thing is don't even consider to start a business if you've gone through bankruptcy, and you've got bad credit not going to happen. You've got to get rid of that. Everything, a lot of stuff in this industry is built on credit. So you need to think about where is your money coming from. Okay, you could do a crowdfunding. We had one girl who uh, I was working with, she, but she'd already established a market. She was using her prints on leggings and we raised $98,000 for her on a crowdfunding. But she already proved that she knew what she was doing. People won't invest in people until you've got proof that what you're doing people want to buy. And you, being the owner, is also aware of what's involved in producing the garments. A lot of people, when I ask them, why do you want to start your own business? Well, I don't like working for anybody. Well, I'm telling you, when you start your own business, you're going to be starting work at 5 o'clock in the morning and you're going to finish it at 12 o'clock at night. It's not a 9 to 5 job. So you've got to be prepared for long days and a lot of aggravation working with people that you don't really know do they know what they're doing? You know, you've got to be on top of it, be on top of your production, making sure that what's being made for you is what you wanted to have made for you and not turning out with a load of stuff that's, oh my God, you made it in India and it's shipped over here and suddenly, you know, you don't know what to do with it. If you're producing offshore, make sure you have an agency who can do the checking of the goods before it's shipped and then you pay the goods. But you don't have the goods shipped and then you pay them. Oh no, it doesn't work. You'll end up with goods that are in a warehouse and you'll end up that's not going to work. So you've got to know and protect yourself when you're thinking about going offshore. If you're doing domestic, again, you need to know, have they got recommendations? Who have they worked with? So making sure that everything, again, as I say, it's built on relationships. Make sure those relationships are the ones that you feel will benefit you and you can benefit them. You're both bringing something to the table. 
So funding is something you need to first of all at least get going and find a demand and then maybe you can go out and get funding. We, we are involved with a lot of like these funding agencies where you can pitch to the angels and see whether or not they get money. But they want to see traction. It won't happen otherwise. A lot of time the investing in the fashion, because fashion is a risky business as any business, but a lot of time fashion funding comes from veteran CEO that were in the fashion business. Um, Andrew Rosen of Theory, you know, he used to invest in a ton of new brands. He, I mean, he invested in Rag and Bone. You'll see a lot of seasoned people in the industry that know the business. They know the old business and they know the new business. And they're the ones who usually invest heavily in new designers. Um, and they know the market better than anybody. So it's you really have to come to them well prepared. You can't come to them with sketches on a, on a board in a dream. I mean, you have to really have all your business, your analytics, everything really tight with a nice package, tech packs, everything, I mean, just everything in design because there's just so much um, out-of-pocket cost for a designer. And I think that you have to really, really have a well-thought-out plan. So I think funding should start coming from, you know, yourself, as she said, and then later on you, you kind of look at the big picture. We're actually in that position at our company. We've been in business for over over 10 years, and we are just now looking at looking at funding um, on a larger scale. Um, and that's just come with the street credibility of our brand, and we feel like, you know, that's we're, we're, we're finally ready. The other thing I would really strongly suggest is, if you're going out now and you're starting your brand, know what it is you want. We had one girl come to us and she was a banker and she wanted to make some more interesting clothing for businesswomen and she invested $54,000 in getting the samples made. And she came in with them, she was so proud to show me these jackets and I, I did not know how to react, they were made so badly. So know what you want to do and understand how a garment should look. She had to throw away $54,000 worth of goods because they were not acceptable. You know, a tailored jacket that's all got, instead of having a busted collar, it was sandwiched in between. The, the sleeves were all hanging out like this. Anybody who knows the industry and knows how to make a garment know immediately, okay, why is that cap hanging out like this? Because the cap needs more measurement on top of the cap. So you really need to know what you're doing and what you're asking because if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what you're asking, you'll get exactly that. So know, in knowing what you need is very important. Uh, what's, a, what's, an what's an appropriate price range for samples? Depends on what you're making. Yeah. What do you? Good. What's? I would say it starts at 500 for a pattern and sample, and it goes up to could be even $1,200 for a, a tailored jacket and pants. So you need to understand and appreciate. Get people who know what they're doing. You have to pay somebody. You know how many pieces are in a tailored jacket? There could be 70 pieces. It takes time. And you got to factor in the you know fittings. You know, did some? I had a client one time that she did. I, I don't remember what the garment was. Paid eight hundred dollars for the first pattern and sample, and the guy went back and wanted to charge her every time she made a change. So you have to say right away, how much is that pattern and first sample going to cost me, and how many changes am I allowed to do, and how many times can we fit it and remake it? Because if not, it's just price tag, price tag, price, and next thing you know, it's a twelve hundred dollar sample. You shouldn't be paying for more than twice to have a sample made. It Absolutely, means you've gone there without knowing what you want. Uh, you talked about having a mentor, right, to help you grow the business. Um, what, is there any platform or some, you know, association where we can align yourself to a mentor to help you grow the business? I think CFDA does a really nice job. Um, do you guys have any? Do you have any suggestions? Uh, CFDA is a really for startup companies. Um, do you have any? Well, I had the, for 20 years Fashion for Profit, uh, Fashion Business Incorporated, FBI, um, but now we. We've gone to a, from a non-profit to a for-profit, but we have a lot of consultants on our website who can help you with your branding from designing to production to marketing. All the people that you see, I've got how many, 19 seminars this week, and a lot of the people that I work with are experts in the industry. Sorry, I think I misunderstood the question. Did you say mentor or did you say for like investor? Mentors. Well, they're me mentors, you know, what do you mean? Mentors going to do it for free? 
now. I don't think so. so I, I was referring to CFDA for funding for new designers. I'm sorry, just to clarify. Did they do that? For new and up-and-coming designers, there's a, there's a couple programs um, that will, you can apply for grants. Um, if you live in the city of New York right now, there's a ton of grants for new designers up-and-coming if you are in the New York base, and I'm sure there's probably some similar in, in LA, um, but usually there's incentives for producing in certain areas. So for in New York, I believe the incentive is for Industry City, because they're basically pulling everybody out of the garment district of Manhattan, so because they're building condos and great hotels and everything, so they're making everybody go to over to Industry City in New York, and there's a lot of incentives, uh, tax breaks, things like that for um, for money for new and upcoming designers and existing designers to come over, pattern makers, everybody. Of, of. One thing I would suggest is any of you who are minority-owned businesses is to register with the SBA, and the SBA has incentives and money to available to give small grants to minority-owned businesses. And they, eventually, if you wanted to grow, I, people like Macy's and North actually have buyers who want to buy from minority-owned businesses and they have twice a year vendor diversification days where they work with uh, minority-owned companies. Also companies that are working with artisans in small countries, there's incentives for that as well. I have quite a few friends that, um, I'm half Colombian so I have a lot and I work with Pro-Columbia a lot, but uh, there's artisans in Colombia and you work with uh, these women foundations and there's incentives for designers who work with these small villages and help little small villages survive. Uh, so actually there's incentive money for for choosing to work with those artisans and makers. Well, I actually work for the United Nations and I do that for women in business in Peru and in Nepal producing cashmere products. So there are, there are ways out there. If you've got the niche, there may be a possibility to find that. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank Hope you, guys. Helped. Thank you.